All right. So this sicha is from Chelek Dalid, the fourth uh, volume of Lekutei Sichas, from the Hesophis, from uh, the additional material in the back. And the um, title is Yud Gimel Tishrei, the 13th day of the month of Tishrei, which is the Yem Hilula, the yard site of the Rebbe Maharash, fourth Chabad Rebbe. And um, being that this is Lukut Esichas, this is an edited talk. Uh, the original Fabrengen was Yud Gimel Tishrei, meaning the day itself of Yud Gimel Tishrei, which the Rebbe would often Fabreng for that occasion. Uh, the year was Tov Shin Chav Beis, which would have been not yet not 1962, because, you know, the uh, Jewish year changes a few months before the secular year. So it would have been like the last few months of 1961. At any rate, In, con- in connection with the 13th of Tishrei, which is the yard site, the day of passing of the Rebbe Maharash, I'm going to tell a story that I was saying in first person. I'm going to tell a story from the one whose yard site is today, Mashakara Bimei Yaldusei, that happened in his youth. Beshana Tov Reish Vav Oi Tov Reish Zayin, in the year either Tov Reish Vav or Tov Reish Zayin, that means either 5606 or 5607. Meaning what? 1846 or 1847? Is my math right? Yeah, I think so. Becholayfen lifnei had fosses halukutei teira shahaya b'shnas tov reish ches. At any rate, it had to have been before the publishing of lukutei teira in tov reish ches, 5608. 1848. The Tzemach Tzedek was very fond of his son, the Rebbe Maharash, who used to come enter into his room every single day. Okay, the Tzemach Tzedek had seven sons, the Rebbe Maharash was the youngest, and the eventual successor, all of the brothers became leaders in some capacity, uh, but they took on uh, leadership of different communities. The, the Rebbe Marash was the one who inherited Lubavitch, the actual town of Lubavitch, the leadership there. And he was the next in the link of the chain of Rebbe's. At any rate, so the Rebbe Marash used to enter into his father, the Tzemach Tzedek, every single day. Ula Pomim, and then sometimes, Gam Pomim Achodes Beyem, sometimes a few times. Pam Nichnas Elov Basha Mu'cheres Balayla. One time, he entered at a late hour at night. Achrei HaYechidus Shnim Shchazman Rav. After Yechidus, meaning the private audiences that had gone on for a long time. So apparently the Tzemach Tzedek had been entertaining uh, visitors. I don't mean entertaining visitors like, uh, you know, serving tea. I mean, granting yichidus. That means allowing people to come in and have their soul-to-soul moment, which uh, yichidus is a time where one seeks not just uh, counsel and advice and guidance and blessing, but it's a time of um, bearing one's soul. It's a special type of meeting that, that a chassid has with the rabbi. So the Tzemech Tzedek had been granting Yechidus meetings, and it went on for a long time. Yesu Mekfi Haragil, more than usual. So it was a particularly long session of Yechidus. Behemshech Diburam, in the course of their conversation. So now the Rebbe Marash is speaking with the Tzemach Tzedek. He's saying in Kveit Kriyus Admor HaTzemach Tzedek Lifnei Benoi, the Tzemach Tzedek complained 
in front of his son. Al bitul zmanei biglala yechidus about the bitul zman, <coughs> about how much time was spent because of the yechidus. Ba'amrei, and he said, Ma roitzi mi many? What do they want from me? Um, I'm not sure if I'm capable of conveying this, but the reason that I find this sicha fascinating and why I wanted to share it with you is because of this incredibly rare glimpse into the behind the scenes. Um, there are very few stories that give this level of the private uh, behind the scenes conversations and mentality and perspective of the Rebbe, it's just highly unusual that we would have a story like this. And obviously the fact that the Rebbe told this story was deliberate. Um, the Rebbe was privy to many insider stories that he would have heard, mostly from his father-in-law. Um, and the Rebbe, whenever the Rebbe would choose to reveal one of these stories, it was always extreme. I mean, everything that Rebbe did was extremely deliberate, but especially we're talking about this was at a public address. Remember, this was a Yud Gimel Tishrei Fabrengen. So the Rebbe is basically creating public record. <clears throat> and that's a very crass way of saying, saying it, is creating public record. It's more than that. It's when a Rebbe says something, it's bringing it more into the world, making it uh, more of a, a reality here. At any rate, uh, I just think it's, a, it's, it's such an interesting insight. At any rate, so the Tzemach Tzedek says to the Rebbe Marash, and I want to be careful how I describe it because I want to be very um, mindful. We're talking about extremely holy people here, but uh, forgive me for the crass expression, after an exhausting day of work. Okay, uh, you, you understand, his day of work was yechidus. Yechidus means literally opening yourself up to connect to the deepest, deepest soul of the people who are seeking you out. So he turns to his son, he says, what do they want from me? I could be learning during this time. I could be learning during this time. And, and you think about what that means. We're not talking about somebody who is trying to be comfortable in life and he's trying to choose between what he prefers personally. We're talking about somebody who's devoted his entire life to, to the community. The Tzemach Tzedek is saying, like, why do they, th why do they think, basically is how I'm interpreting it, and I, I hope I'm not taking liberties. Why do they think this is the best use of my time? I want you to understand, the Tzemach Tzedek's not complaining like, you know, I, I like chocolate instead of vanilla. It's not a personal preference thing. What he's saying is, why did they force me to spend so much time in this capacity, meaning taking these Yechidis meetings, when I could be learning during that time, meaning ostensibly what the Tzemach Tzedek is accomplishing through his learning is more beneficial to the world and, and even to those people who are seeking him out, it's more beneficial than granting these, these audiences. And remember, what are these people coming in talking about? Um, a lot of them are coming in talking about Parnosa, the, you know, they, they, they can't make enough money, and which, what, should they move towns for a new business opportunity, or they're asking about health matters for a family member, or a, a shidduch, they're trying to marry off a kid, you know, real mundane pedestrian day-to-day -day type stuff, and you're talking about, again, I really hope I'm not being crass here, but imagine if somebody could, when Albert Einstein was at Princeton, you ever seen that picture? Somebody came in on the day he died and they took a picture of his desk and the chalkboard in the background. Imagine if anyone who wanted to could just 
walk in, I mean, I guess wait your turn, but then walk after waiting your turn, you walk into Albert Einstein's office while he's in the middle of figuring out uh, whatever he was working on. He already did the theory of relativity at that point, but you can go to Princeton and come in and say um, to Albert Einstein, um, I had to sell my cow this year and I'm not sure how I'm gonna make a living and I have a couple kids who need to get married. Like, please, <laughs> you see these chalkboards over here? <laughs> that means I'm involved in some deep stuff. I can't really be having this conversation right now, right? Okay, so it's kind of wild, this idea that we're coming to a Torah giant Semach Tzedek was absolutely prolific as far as not only, it's very similar to his, his grandfather, the Alta Rebbe, not just uh, Chassidus, the Torah Sanister, Pnimius Torah, but also Torah Sanigla, the revealed parts of Torah. He was a Paisic. A Paisic means he was a halachic um, ruler. He made decisions. People would write to him with halachic uh, dilemmas. So he wasn't just uh, a master of the mystical parts of Torah, but also of the revealed, what we call the revealed parts of Torah, meaning the legalistic. So he's complaining to his son, the Rebbe Manash, and saying, what do they want from me? I could be learning during this time. The Rebbe Manash didn't answer anything. Nigish el oren hasforim shaboy hoyu munochim kisve dach shalatzemach tzedek. Rather, what he did, the Rebbe Marash got up and he walked over to the. Um, I shouldn't say he got up. Maybe he was already standing. It's possible that he stood. Quite possible he stood always in the presence of his father. But he walked over to the <coughs> uh, bookshelf where the Kisve Dach, Dach is an acronym, Divrei Elakim Chaim, the words of the living God. That's a uh, Hasidic way of referring to the writings of Hasidus, the Maimorim that Arabe says. So there were Kisve Dach, there were writings of the Tzemach Tzedek's own Hasidus, his own Maimorim. Um, and uh, they were on the shelf there in the room. So the Rebbe Marash got up and he walked over to where these, these books, these Sfarim, these holy books, were. He removed the, or he, um, yeah, he removed the curtain. And in parentheses it says, For this bookshelf, there were no doors. It wasn't like a cabinet. Verak porus hoyo olov, but rather what they did is they spread out upon it viloin a curtain. So the Rebbe Marash removed the curtain. I don't think it means he took it off. It probably means he like, you know, lifted it to reveal the, uh, the Svarim, the, the holy books that were there. And he started counting the number of volumes that were on one of the shelves. He counted more than 30 volumes. And he turned to his father with a question. You know, they say, what's the most Jewish answer to a question? There's another question. So, what, what had the Tzemach Tzedek asked? What do they want from me? I could be learning during this time. And the Rebbe Marash did not answer. Rather, he got up, he walked, I mean, again, I don't know if he got up. He walked over to the bookshelf, he parted the curtain, and he starts counting the books. These are not books that the Tzemach Tzedek owned. It wasn't to show him what a big library he owned. These were books that he had authored 
in his lifetime. And he starts counting them, one, two, three, four, and he got up to over 30 books. And the Rebbe Marash turned to his father and he asked him a question. Ho'im ho'yisa kaisev kol kach harbe maimorim. Would his father have been able to write so many maimorim gam im loy ho'yisa mekabal anoshim al yechidus if he hadn't received so many people in yechidus yanei otamach tzedek kein ata tzedek. Tzemach Tzedek answered, yes, you're right. You understand the question? Would you have been able to write all of these books if you hadn't given people Yechidus as much as you, ha- as much as you would, had done? And the Tzemach Tzedek answered him, you're right, actually. Meaning, I wouldn't have been able to produce so much Chesidus in writing if I had not granted so many people Yechidus. When my father-in-law told this story, that I was saying, when his father, I mean his father-in-law, his, his Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, told this story, Hoysef, he added, maybe this will give us more clues into understanding the meaning of what happened. Shloisha sugim hoyu bikisvei hatamach tzadik. There were three types, three categories within the writings of the Tzemech Tzedek. So the Rebbe is saying when his father-in-law told this story, he would add to the story this fact, which was that the Tzemech Tzedek's writings included three categories. Aleph, Rishimus Hanochais Maimorim Shishama, transcripts, of my modem that he heard, meaning from the Alter Rebbe, from his grandfather. Base, biurim al my modem, commentaries or explanations of my modem, meaning not just a strict transcript, but his elucidation of what the Mimer was saying. Gimel, my modem shakosif betur Rebbe. My modem that he himself had authored as a Rebbe in his own right. Okay, because the first two categories are either the transcripts of another Rebbe or his commentaries of the my modem of another Rebbe. The third category are his own original my modem. The Rev Hakrachim Shahoyu Bi'itztabazu and most of the volumes that were on that particular shelf mentioned in the story, were from the third category. Just information to share with you. That when the Friedrich Rebbe would tell this story, or when he told it, he added that piece of information. By the way, JFYI, when the Rebbe Marash pointed out that one shelf and said, would you have managed to produce so much chesidus if you hadn't granted so much time to yechidus? And, he, and the, and the Tamar Tzedek said, no, the, the, the books or the holy books that the, the Rebbe Marash was pointing to mostly were the original insights of the Tamar Tzedek. Okay. It's understood that when the Tzemach Tzedek said, I could have been learning during this time, It is obvious that when he said, I could have been learning more during this time, it, his intention was not to hold back or even to diminish the influence that he was giving through Yechidus in order to learn more for himself. 
That's not possible. You understand that I was saying, it's not like he was saying he would like to take away time from others and give more time for himself. Because it is a halacha that you are not only allowed to, you're supposed to be mevatel you're supposed to negate the study of Torah if, if, when, there's a mitzvah that only you can fulfill. And what the Tzemach Tzedek was able to accomplish through Yechidus, what he was able to give people through Yechidus, nobody else could give that. Only the Tzemach Tzedek could do it. So he had permission, according to Torah, to do what he was doing. And furthermore, Allah we are promised that when you give tzedakah, in this case, not just monetary, but with your heart and soul, your brain and heart become refined a thousandfold. So, the Rebbe is saying like this. When the Tzemach Tzedek was saying, why do they make me have these meetings? I could be learning during this time. It wasn't like he was saying, I want to take away from what I'm doing for the people. Rather, we have to look at it like this. First of all, he had a Torah dispensation, clearly, to not be learning during that time because giving Yechidus was a mitzvah that only he could do. Okay? And also... By get, granting Yechidus, it was refining his heart and mind, meaning it was making it possible for him to learn on an even higher level during the times when he was learning. Allah, so rather, Shiniskavan Laimer, what was he intending to say? Shigam Ayede Limude Hayayachal Ashbia, Aison Hashboyas Hashem Mashbia Al Yede Yechidus. That through learning, he could actually deliver the same thing he was delivering through Yechidus. Parentheses, Similar to the way Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai, was able to make it rain through his Torah study. Others would pray for rain, Rabbi Shimon would learn Torah, his Torah would make it rain. In other words, the Tzemach Tzedek was saying like this, Why are they asking to get from me in this style of delivery, I could go learn, not instead of giving them what they want, I could go learn in order to give them what they want. I can give them what they want, I can give it to them through learning. That the Tzemach Tzedek's learning would have been able to deliver to them what, what they wanted, what they were seeking in Yechidus. You understand what, what, what the Rebbe is saying? He wasn't complaining and saying, how could they take me away from my chiyav of limud ha Because we know that Torah exempts somebody when they're doing a mitzvah that nobody else can do. He wasn't saying, I'm losing out on my limud ha because we know that by giving generously to other people, it was refining his mind and heart. So during the times he was able to learn, he was able to, quote unquote, catch up. Really what he was saying was, why do they want me to deliver it this way I can give them the same end result through my learning. Okay. So now we understand the father's question. Now we have to understand the son's answer. Following? Okay. The alzeh on the kvikr marash. And this is what the Rebbe Marash answered. Asher hakoyach leksivas maimorim, mesu gimel, betur nasi, shinyonim hamshachas in yoni steam deraisa begiloi. That the power to write maimorim of the third category, meaning that which constituted his own insights as a Rebbe unto himself, and to reveal the hidden Torah in a revealed way. Bo ayedea ashpa ba eifin shel hislab shostafka. It came about specifically in a manner of hislabshus. Hislabshus literally translated means in clothing or investment, like a lavush is a, a garment. 
ve'oifene hislabshus. Hislabshus means that when you take something and you dress it up in another thing. There are two ways that something, particularly we're talking about uh, uh, something intangible, can be transmitted. One is you just put it out there and it's out there. The other is hislabshus, where you're actually getting it to fit the recipient in an integrated way. So what we're saying is like this. The Tzemach Tzedek could have generated Chassidus and put it out in the world, and it would have been in the world, and it surely would have had a certain kind of effect in the world just, just for existing. But Hislabshus means that it was put out there in a way that was accessible, that people were able to relate to it. But we're in the middle of a sentence. I want to just finish here. But even his slabshus dafka, yechidus, ki yedua she yechidus who inyan gilu yechidus shem nefesh. We know the yechidus is the revelation of the yechida of the soul, the fifth level, which is not a level, which which is really the core, the essence of the soul. Shem bechina zu nimshach hakayach la miras lekzivas maimorim, and from the the level of yechida comes forth the power to. Say and write chsidis. Follow what, what the Rebbe is saying here. It's not just the yechida of the chsidim who are coming to yechidas. It's also the tamach tzaddik's yechida. And when, and, and in truth, once you're talking about yechida, you can't even make such differentiation between the chassid and the Rebbe, because that's the whole point. Yechida means yachid, it means oneness. That it was specifically the forum of Yechidus that put the Tzemech Tzedek into a mode of Hislabshus. That whatever holy energy he was giving off was transmitted in a form that others were able to integrate it. Now, what does that mean? It becomes slightly more apparent as we continue. But at this point, just let, let's, let's establish like this. In theory, the Tzemech Tzedek could have benefited those people just by putting out more books. And that indeed was what he was complaining. He was saying, I could be more involved in scholarship. My scholarship would help people. My scholarship would make the world a better place for those very people who are seeking me. And that, that Rebbe Maharash was pointing out, yeah, but there are different modes of having an influence. And specifically, it's the Yechidus forum that puts your influence into a mode of Hislabshus, where what you're putting out there is being received in an integrated fashion. During Yechidus? No, no, it doesn't mean that you're sitting in Yechidus and you're processing the, the content of your books. That's not what it means. It means that the time that the Tzemech Tzedek is spending with people, one-on-one, -on -one, is changing the way that his influence is received in the world. Or maybe even changing the way he puts out his influence. How much time do we have over here? Okay, let, 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 let's move quickly. Umay nazu hutzrach lavoi mibnoi. This answer had to come from his son, who afterwards became his successor. It was he specifically who was able to, to arouse this in his father. Meaning, his son, who was not yet a Rebbe, but who would go on to be a Rebbe, and understood, at least in some potential form, what a Rebbe is, and he was able to point out to his father how the Yechidus format was essential 
to his father's role as a Rebbe. <laughs> saying, how did he not know it before? First of all, every good teacher only tells you what you already knew. What are they s Of course. All truth is uh, plagiarism. Only lies are original. <laughs> but sometimes you need to hear it confirmed, or you need to hear it stated in a little bit different terminology. In fact, that's a prob probably a pretty good example of hislabshus. Like, I always kind of knew that to be true, but it didn't click for me until so-and-so said it in such and such a format. That's a great example of hislabshus. At any rate. Also, he wanted to make sure that his son knows it, too. Well, it could also be that he wanted his son to know, but I think it was also a genuine interaction. I think it was a genuine uh, question that Tzemach Tzedek was asking. Maybe it was just like a frustration. It, well, I think it was a frustration. He was actually asking. He was just like frustrated at that specific moment of all the time he had thought he could have been learning Torah. Right. Yeah, I'm sure all of these things are true. Okay, let's, let's continue here. We don't have a lot of time. Sipure tzadikim gamma she'ira bimei yaldusam ubefrat oisam she'gilo lonu Nosi Meira Derech. Stories of the righteous, even those stories that happened when they were young, meaning the story happened when the Rebbe Marash was young, but especially those stories that were told to us or revealed to us by a Nasi, meaning the Rebbe's Rebbe was the one who revealed the story. Hey, Rois Hein Bavedaseno, they are. Directions for our service of Hashem. V'chein gam benegel esiparanal. So too with this story. He ne neisef al masha onu royim beze as gedol chachmosay shel kveid kedushas ad memarash gam bime yaldusa. In addition to the fact that we glimpse the wisdom of the Rebbe Marash even as a young man, kamamir azal like it says, butzin butzin mekatve yadia little pumpkins, you can know them from their uh, youth. You can tell them, you can already tell when they're little, how they're going to grow. So you can tell his wisdom from two things. First of all, just the very fact that even as a kid, he knew how to arouse his father. He knew how to sort of wake him up. And also, the specific answer that he gave, He didn't answer him straight. He answered him as a question. And it wasn't just to be clever. Like I said, you know, a Jew answers a question with a question. But also it was because of the halacha of Kibbutz Av, and he wanted to be very careful with honoring his father. So instead of acting like, oh, his father didn't know something, he did know it, he just sort of asked a question back to allow his father to be the one to answer it. So that shows his wisdom. But there's a teaching here for our Avedo. Although it is true that every good thing that a person does, everything unto itself has an effect that it tips the scales, like the Rambam famously described the image, every good deed tips the scales toward merit, and it refines the world, meaning every little thing is connected to the entire world. No man is an island, in a good way, meaning everything affects everything. Although that's true, meaning to say if you go and do something good on your own that nobody knows about, it actually is 
in a spiritual way, benefiting the whole world for everybody. Yes, that's true. Ainless topic, Bezeb, but we cannot be satisfied only with that. The refinement of the world has to be specifically in this manner of hislabshus, which I'll call getting involved in real life. How about that as a functional translation? Now the Rebbe is saying not just a story about the Tzemach Tzedek, the Rebbe is saying a hayra for us, that by getting involved in other people's lives in a manner of islabshus, meaning actually trying to put yourself in their shoes and understanding their situations and understanding how they think, it adds extra light for the giver as well. The Kudrash Razal, like our sages say, Al Pasuk on the verse from Mishle, I believe it is, Meyer Ene Shnehem Hashem. Hashem enlightens the eyes of both of them, both the teacher and the student, the giver and the recipient. So I'll say some very daring stuff that I probably have no right to say. Um, the Rebbe's Igris, in a way, is like Yechidus. Because you see the Rebbe dealing with people's regular lives. All types of people are writing to the Rebbe about all types of real-life questions. And you can see the, the way the Rebbe guides people to deal with family issues, money issues, health issues, every type of thing. It's like seeing how the Rebbe operates in Yechidus. Now that same Rebbe is also the author of Maimorim that are describing levels of Ishtaushlis that are pre-Tzimtzum. <laughs> and like, not only is it the same person, you know, we can't imagine, like I was saying before, you go to Einstein, you bother him in the middle of his chalkboard stuff in Princeton and ask him for some uh, life advice. doesn't really make sense. But not only does it not make sense because it's like, why are you bothering this incredibly important, busy guy? But it's like, why would you expect he would have an answer? Because the truth is, I wouldn't think Einstein could give good life advice, especially not when he's, what? His life was a mess. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> right. So it's kind of a wild concept that one person could be the, the genius and could be the practical guide. They're usually not the same guy. So what we're saying here is that, I want to be so careful, but it was The Rebbe's ability to teach the deepest concepts, to reveal the deepest chassidus, cannot be divorced from the Rebbe's practical, just practical, down-to-earth, caring, compassionate guidance. You can't separate the two because the reality is that one actually makes the other possible, which is counterintuitive, because they seem like opposites. They seem like, if you, even if you had a, a potential to specialize in one area, by specializing in one area, it would tear you away from the other, per se. And what we're saying is, no, it's actually one and the same thing. And then, not only is the Rebbe saying this as an insight about how a Rebbe functions, but the Rebbe is then saying, this is actually talking about how we function, which is a classic trope in the Rebbe's teachings, is all, always to take stories of the Rebbe's and make it about us, where the Rebbe is saying like this. If you want to really have an, a, a, an influence, you want to really be holy, you want to really be true to your soul's mission in this world, yeah, obviously that's through learning Torah. Of course it is. But it's also through talking to regular people about regular life and helping them. Okay, so you want my fan theory? Totally, this is like, I take no responsibility for any of this being accurate or correct. 
I'm just now just saying some stuff. So you guys know me a little bit. You know that I, I don't have real social anxiety. I more have like sensitivity to stimuli that makes social interaction unpleasant for me. You guys know that about me. Like I get very highly like dysregulated easily because I get overwhelmed by stimulus and I, and I, and I, and, and like, I, okay. So I don't like interacting with people. Oh, this class is a great example. Okay. <laughs> I don't mean it in that way, but I kind of do mean it in that way. It's, <laughs> which is a great, okay. Right. Everybody get out. All right. It's not, it's not easy for me to come here. It's not easy for me to go anywhere. I'm the type of person, I've only later in my life forced myself to show up at people's simchas because I finally figured out that people care about that. <laughs> took me years, took me decades to find out people care if you go to their simchas. Because it's so painful for me to go. Because it's like, okay, but at any rate. I could spend this hour learning on my own. I could probably learn more quickly. I can promise you, I've seen for myself, I would never, ever, and, and, and as much as I still complain about it, which is really a chutzpah on my part, <laughs> but as much as I hate having to explain things to people, why didn't they understand that? That was so patently obvious. Why are you asking that question? As much as it's annoying for me, the hislabshus, having to actually speak in a way that other people could understand and use what you're saying, um, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't understand anything. I wouldn't understand. I would think I understood. Maybe on some abstract level I would understand. So I'm saying from personal experience, even if it's unpleasant to have to do the human interaction aspect of things, that's where everything comes together. That's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And I don't think my experience is completely unique. I think this is something that everyone can apply in their own way. It's like when you have something especially inspirational that you've learned, it's not really complete until you can give it over to somebody in a way that they can act on it. But do you feel like with the Ami letters and everything that made you different? Yeah, the Ami column, which I hate. I mean, I, it's not nice for me to say that I hate it, but I really hate it. Not, it's far from my comfort. It's my discomfort zone. Um, but there's no question that it changed my brain. And it, even on just a, a physical level, but certainly spiritually, it, yeah, of course it benefited me. And I don't mean it benefited me like, oh, you, you had a reputation for him. I mean, don't question it spiritually benefited me. And, I, and again, I don't mean the, the merit of having helped people. I mean, I wouldn't be able to understand things. I wouldn't process wise. Yeah, exactly. 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 Um, but we're not saying it's about the Rebbe. Like well, we kind of are saying about the Rebbe. We just want to be careful how we say it because, you know, it's the Rebbe. But look, when, when I, I keep going back to the Einstein thing. When Einstein came to Princeton, nobody, well, Einstein is a Yid, nobody was going to say, oh, we have Einstein at Princeton. Let him teach. He didn't teach a class. You know why he didn't teach a class? Because that would be a total waste of having Einstein. Now imagine, not only you have Einstein, and not only he's going to teach a class, he's going to teach a 101 survey of physics class to a bunch of 18-year-olds. No, no, not that. No, in fact, you're going to have Einstein sit in the cafeteria and answer questions about life. And every Schmendrick can come over and say, um, you know, I'm having this issue, that issue, anxiety, relationships, and Einstein's going to have to answer you. I'm saying that's that's a crazy concept. So what we're saying is it's counterintuitive. Specialize in one thing or the other. The, the two should not not only they don't go together, one diminishes from the other. We're saying no. You can't have one without the other. Isn't that what's about it's a wild concept. In the introduction that really it is better that if, if, if it would have been possible would have been better to answer each person individually but was it possible? In the introduction of, of Tanya, 
Yes, he's saying that it's not possible to give everybody their, but it's also interesting what he says, and therefore I created a system of, of mashpiyim. But it's the same thing. He wouldn't have been able to create that system if not for all the time he spent first answering real people's questions. Why would he? Oh, 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 I hear your insight. You're saying that Al Tareb based Tanya on Yechidis. If he hadn't had all of those Yechidis conversations, who knows if he would have been able to write Tanya? It's a very bold statement, and it's probably true. According to what we just learned, it's probably true. Which is a wild concept. Okay, at any rate, um, thanks for coming out. Thank you. Um, Halik Dalit. Yeah, you can turn it off.